thank you for joining us for another live Action for Happiness event. It's fantastic to see you joining us as ever from all around the world uh, as part of this amazing community of people taking action to create a happier and kinder world together. I'm really excited about our special guest for today's event, David Brooks, someone I've admired for a long time, of course, a columnist and author and really a leading thinker on many of the social challenges of our times. And today's event is on the theme of deeper connections. And David, I'm, I'm really grateful for you sparing time to spread your ideas with this community. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's a total pleasure and honor. I'm so glad to be invited. Uh, for anyone who's new to one of these events, a very warm welcome. But I see also already lots and lots of you are members of this community, uh, contributing and as ever, keeping things kind and supportive in the chat and welcoming each other. Please continue to do that. We also have the chance to ask David some questions. So please do use the Q&A function to put any questions and we'll come to those a bit later in the event. But basically, David and I will have a, an interactive conversation for about half an hour, slightly longer. And we'll also be doing a couple of interactive things to get you involved along the way and hear your perspectives. On this hugely important topic, I would argue in many ways, this is the central challenge we face as a human species, how to connect with, to see, and to sort of um, be in community with each other. But before we go into that topic, I'd love um, to uh, invite you, David, to say a little bit more about your background. We obviously know of you as a writer, but maybe you could paint a little picture about what the journey you've been on and what's particularly brought you to this topic. Yeah, I have uh, indeed been on a journey. I feel a sneeze coming on, so if that hits me, you will know. <laughs> okay, I just talked it away. Uh, <laughs> a human moment there. Uh, so I, um, if you, I open the book by saying, if you ever watch that movie, Fiddler on the Roof, you know how emotional and huggy Jewish families can be. They're always singing and dancing. Uh, and I come from the other kind of Jewish family. <laughs> and so no offense to those in England, but uh, our, our culture around our house was act Yid think Yiddish, act British. Uh, and so that was sort of stiff upper lip, emotional reserve. And then I became a writer. I read a book called Paddington the Bear when I was seven. And I decided that moment I was going to write. And that's a bit of a solitary cerebral profession. Uh, I remember in high school, I wanted to date this woman named Bernice. She didn't want to date me. She dated some other guy. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. And so those were my values. Uh, and then I went to a university that's super intellectual called the University of Chicago. The admissions officers at Columbia, Wesleyan, and Brown University decided I should go to the Chicago and not their own fine institutions. And that also is super cerebral. Uh, my favorite saying about Chicago, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. And so again, a lot up here. And I learned in middle age that if you cut yourself off from emotion, and if you cut yourself off from intimacy, you're cutting yourself off from life itself. And so I set out to write off, to go on a journey really. And I did it because I'm a writer by writing books. I wrote a book about emotion called The Social Animal. Then I wrote a, wrote a book about morality about called The Road to Character. And the last two books are really about how to build intimate connection. And believe me, I am not naturally talented at this. And so uh, there's a, my, one of my favorite saying is that writers are beggars who tell other beggars where we found bread. So if I read something that'll help me become more human and to connect with somebody, in the book, I just share it. And I think I really have changed a little, and I can prove it to you, but I have to do a little name dropping. And so I've been interviewed twice in my life by Oprah, uh, and once in 2014 and once in 2019. And after the 2019 interview, she pulls me aside and she says, David, I've rarely seen somebody change so much in middle age. You, you were so emotionally blocked before. So hopefully I've learned to become a little more, a little more vulnerable. Hopefully I've learned better intimacy and learned to express my emotions and receive your emotions. Oh, thank you, David. I was really touched by that Oprah story when I read it in the book and about that idea of you sort of having been on a journey to become more human, perhaps at a time when, in fact, our world is becoming less uh, less of uh, able to be human. And of course, your latest book is How to Know a Person, which I've been really enjoying and I guess is the foundation for our conversation today. Um, what I love about it actually is it's very much in tune with the action for happiness spirit of we can each make a difference in the way that we behave. So I think we're going to spend a lot of our time together talking about the practicalities of how to connect, how to have good relationships. But before we go there, I just wanted to pause for a moment and note the kind of social context we're in right now and maybe 
I mean, you're particularly well placed with all your columns and observations on wider society, but it feels to me that we're in a particular time of fragmentation, of inability to see each other, to understand each other, to listen to each other. I wondered if you could just speak to that for a little bit and give us your sense of where we're at uh, with yeah. some of these challenges. I think in, in many Western countries and maybe in all countries, uh, we've seen a, a rise of sadness and a rise of meanness. And I know the statistics from the United States best, but the U.S. is not alone here. And so there's rising depression rates, rising suicide rates. Uh, the number of people who say they feel lonely most of the time is 36% of Americans. The number of people who say they have no close personal friends has gone up by four times since 2000. The number of uh, Americans who rate themselves in the lowest happiness category has gone up by 50%. And so those are American statistics, but the phenomenon is worldwide. And the problem is, is when people feel unseen, uh, they regard it as an injustice because it is, and they lash out. And so they feel existentially unsafe when they're unseen. We evolved to be around people who would look out for each other. Uh, and so along with the rise of sadness, there's a rise in meanness. And we see it in our politics and probably all of our countries. Uh, we see it, I ran into a restaurant owner who said, you know, I now have to throw somebody out of my restaurant every week for rude behavior. I have a friend who's a nurse, and she said, um, our trouble is keeping staff because the patients have become so abusive, the nurses get burned out and they want to leave. And so we've just got this oncoming social crisis, and it's hard to build a healthy democracy when your society is, is being ripped to shreds from the bottom. And so to me, people think, well, leading with trust, leading with curiosity, is naive in times like this. We have brutal times, we're at war, we're at each other's throats. But I don't think leading with curiosity and leading with trust is naive. I think it's the most effective thing we can do to see each other and build a society in which people feel safe, respected, and valued. Uh, and we'll never be able to have healthy democracy until we feel we, feel we understand each other. Uh, democracy is not just about voting, it's about human encounter, it's about conversation, compromise, and, and living together across difference. And so right now our social skills are inadequate to the societies we live in. I really feel that, and I'm, I think you've put that so well. And I, I guess I feel really blessed that I was brought up in a family that had a sense of looking for the good in others and assuming that you can behave in trustworthy ways. And yes, occasionally in my life I've been burned and let down, but actually because I've been able to live my life with a sense of trust, with a sense of looking for the good in others, it's brought me such a sort of a sense of, uh, I don't know, a, a grounding and ability to, to stay sane in a challenging world. So, but, mm. but I think this point you particularly make about seeing each other is so vital. What do you mean when you talk about how to know a person, how to see a person? What, why is that so important? Well, I, I, it could be hear a person too. Sometimes I, the title of the book is, the subtitle is to see, seeing others deeply and being deeply seen, but I could have written it, hearing others deeply and being deeply heard because maybe we can talk about this later, the, the first gaze is a very important part of build, establishing trust in a relationship. But really the, the essential humanistic act is to, uh, to have great conversations, to take average conversations and turn them into deep conversations. So you both of you walk away with a deeper knowledge of each other and yourselves. And so we can't imagine, I can't imagine what's going on in your head. I have to ask you, and I ask people all the time, you know, the, the paramount skill in any healthy family, community, or organization, or nation is the ability to make a, to understand the people around you and make them feel understood. And so I always ask people, how good are you at this? And my answer is, you're probably not as good as you think you are. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a guy in the University of Texas who researches this, and he finds that when we meet each other, we accurately understand what's going on in each other's head probably about 20% of the time. Now, some people are really good. They're 55% of the time. Some people understand the other person 0% of the time, but think they understand each other 100% of the time. And so in any society, there are, in any group of people, there are diminishers. And those are people who are not curious about you. They stereotype, they ignore. And then there are illuminators. And those are people who are ask you questions. They're curious about you. They make you feel lit up. And so we want to be better illuminators. And that's really what the book is a guide for. I love that. So there's diminishers and there's illuminators and our mission is to be illuminators. Um, I'd love to, before we get to the practical tips, really pause and, and ask the community to get involved here, David. So 
why don't we take a moment, folks, wherever you are right now, and just try and bring to mind a situation where you felt a really strong, deep connection with another human being, where you really felt seen or heard or safely connected or a sense of trust. Maybe it was recently, maybe it was a long time ago, maybe it's with family or friends or colleagues. And what I'd invite you to do, if you feel able to in the chat, is just share perhaps a couple of words about what is it about that interaction that helped you feel seen or heard or connected? And maybe we, I can just read a few of these out. If you'd just like to share, what, are you, what for you, as you're here today, are some of the building blocks of that sense of being seen? So I'll read these out, David. Both of us were laughing, eye contact, being honest, sense of belonging, feeling, feeling listened to, presence. They validated me. I felt safe, not being judged, genuine curiosity, um, a sense of love, empowerment, humility, laughter, physical touch, uh, humble, truth, accepting me as myself, being open to me, commonality, giving me their full attention, being held, helped, following up questions to what I say, kindness, shared history, and many more that I can't read because they're flying past. Wow, I'm, I think there's a, such a lot of wisdom in that set of comments. Uh, what are you feeling as you see those, David? Yeah, I see following up with questions, that's truly, and humility. I, you know, and I, I've spent the last four years asking people about times they felt seen. And sometimes they're just everyday events. They're not too dramatic. One woman who's probably in her 40s told me about a time when she was 13, she had her first taste of alcohol. And she got so drunk that when her friends dropped her off at home, they just left her on the front porch. And she was so drunk, she couldn't move. And her dad, who was this big, strict disciplinarian guy, came out on the porch and she thought he would scream at her. Uh, the, the, uh, the words that were already in her own head, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. And instead, he just scooped her up in his arms, carried her inside, put her on the sofa, and said, there'll be no punishment here. You've had an experience. And decades later, she remembered, my father got me at that moment. He knew he didn't need to scream at me. He could just let it go. And so just, she remembered that. And people tell me with joyous eyes, those moments. And if it's good to be seen, it's also good to be the seer, to be the person who sees another person. So we're this where you're the backdrop you're seeing of me is my living room. And over there by the blue painting is our front door. And I'm on, the, my laptop's on the dining room table. And a couple of years ago, I was reading a book on this table and my wife walks in the door and she, she stands there in the door frame. The door's open and it's summer and the sun is coming in behind her. And she doesn't even notice I'm there because that's the kind of charisma I have. Uh, and she, but she, her eye rests on an orchid that we keep by the door, the, the, by the door over there. And she's just thinking about something and I look at her and I have this thing go across my consciousness I really know her. I know her through and through. And if you'd asked me what it was I knew about her at that moment, it was not like the personality traits or the words in her biography. I had a sense of the whole of her, sort of the ebb and flow of her music, the harmonies of her rhythm, uh, her incandescence, the occasional insecurities, the flashes of fierceness. And it was like almost as if I wasn't seeing out from her, or I wasn't seeing her, I was seeing out from her. And to really know somebody, you have to know a little about how they see the world. And the only word in the English language that I could think of that describes how I was looking at her at that moment, it was not observing, it was not inspecting, it was just beholding. I was just beholding her. And it was such a great moment. And I told this story weeks later to older friends, and they said, yeah, that's what we do with our grandkids. We just behold. And it's just, it's a way of seeing with appreciation and joy. And it was such a great moment for me. So it's its great to be seen. It's also great to be the seer. I love that. That's a real example of sort of non-judgmental acceptance as well, which I think is so yeah. powerful. I also really value that story about the father and the and the daughter, especially as a as a father of a teenage daughter who's just currently discovering alcohol. <laughs> that is very resonant with me. Um, David, let's come on to some of your ideas and suggestions for how we can see others. You talked a moment ago about when we first meet someone. So maybe we could start there. When you first greet someone, what are some of the ways in which we can really be present for them? Yeah. So when we first meet someone, we're each unconsciously asking ourselves questions. Is it, Am I a priority for this person? Am I a person to this person? And so what we want to do, the, the novelist and philosopher Iris Murdoch said, our goal here is to cast what she called a just and loving attention on others. And so the 
our anxieties, the answers to those questions will be answered by our eyes before any words come out of our mouth. It's the gaze, a gaze of warmth. And so I was in a, a diner in Waco, Texas, which is sort of west of Dallas. Uh, and uh, I was having breakfast with a woman named LaRue Dorsey, who was a 93-year-old lady who portrayed herself to me as a stern disciplinarian. She was a teacher much of her career, and she said, I love my students enough to discipline them. And I was a little intimidated by her. She was formidable. And then into the diner walks a mutual friend of ours named Jimmy Durrell. And Jimmy's a pastor. He pastors to the homeless. And he sees us at the table. He comes up to us. He grabs Mrs. Dorsey by the shoulders. And he shakes her way harder than you should shake a 93-year-old. <laughs> and he says to her, Mrs. Dorsey, Mrs. Dorsey, you're the best. You're the best. I love you. I love you. And that stern disciplinarian lady I had been talking to vanishes in a second and becomes a bright, eye-shining nine-year-old girl. And that's the power of Jimmy's gaze. He brought out a different version and a warmer and a more beautiful version of her than I did with a little cooler gaze. And part of the story is he's just a warm person. But part of the story is that Jimmy is a pastor. So when he sees anybody, he thinks he's seeing a person made in the image of God. He's seeing somebody with a soul of infinite value and dignity. Now, you could be Christian or Jewish or atheist or agnostic or Buddhist or Muslim, but seeing each person you meet with that level of reverence and respect is the first step in seeing them well. You know that they're not a problem to be solved. They're just a, a mystery you'll never get to the bottom of. And so it's, it's a gaze of respect and admiration, that just and loving gaze, as Iris Murdoch put it. So it feels to me that part of that is about non-judgment but, but, uh, and just physical or just presence if in want of a better word. And I, I want to pause just here for one moment to think about the challenge that these devices bring, because I, I find so often now that we're less able to be making eye contact, to be in a room with someone because we've got these digital distractions. Um, do you think that plays a role that, you know, that the, the, there's yeah. something about the virtual world that's taking us away from just being together? Uh, for sure. I mean, you know, on, online there's, judgment everywhere and understanding nowhere. Uh, and online, most of us are in performance mode, but we're not really in listening mode. Mm. And we're certainly not interacting in any deep way. I mean, we're mammals <laughs> and we don't appreciate it, but we smell each other all the time. And I read somewhere that people who lose this sense of smell have a greater emotional deterioration than people who sight or hearing. And so we just, physical presence is just super powerful that we're getting a million different signals from body language, from the rhythm of our conversation. And I think it's just harder online, but not impossible. Uh, I, I have a friend who's a woman and she's in her forties and she's just entering into a romantic relationship. And I was asking her how the relationship was going. And then I said to her, so have you FaceTimed yet? And she said, oh no, we're not that close. <laughs> and so I, FaceTime is kind of an intimate thing. You know, the other person's face is right there on your phone. So I think you can have a kind of good conversation with somebody. But one of the things the devices do is they, they rob us of experience. If we're out at a restaurant with, a, with people or we're at a party, we're having an experience. If we just are scanning our phone all evening, we're just having a distraction. And so I think we literally have fewer social experiences because of the phone. Mm. Well, let's come on to the art of conversation, because when we are with someone, obviously, we've, we've met, you know, we've got past that initial greeting. It's a, maybe it's a, a colleague or a long-standing friend or a, or a life partner or a child. It seems to me that there's a lot about the art of interacting with each other, whether that's getting our point across or listening or indeed both of those things. That's, that's a subtle skill that we perhaps don't spend as much time nurturing and developing and learning as we might we might yeah so what would you say about the art of conversation david and of course it's a process you've got to earn trust so i like small talk people some people don't like small talk i like small talk because we can't be comfortable in the mind until we're comfortable in the body and we're just chatting about football or whatever we're like getting to know each other and sometimes you, a great way to get to know someone is play when we play whether it's poker or tennis or, or anything you're naturally yourself. And you see, I, I've guys I played basketball with my whole life, and I've probably never had a deep conversation with them. But through trash talk and through passing and through high fives, we like know each other and there's some bonding there. So I have great value in, in play. But then conversation, 
you, you should approach a conversation, D.H. Lawrence said, like you approach a deer in the forest, like gently and slowly. And so in the beginning, I often ask people, um, where are you from? And I love to get people talking about their childhood. And people love talking about their childhood. Uh, I like to, I sometimes ask, where'd you get your name? And then, then you get uh, uh, a little story about my ethnic background or, or what my ancestry is. Uh, and then I have questions, and we may go into explore this a little more. Like one of my favorite questions is, uh, what's your favorite unimportant thing about yourself? And I asked this question to a group, and one of the theologians watches a lot of reality trashy TV that I didn't expect. So he tells me that's his favorite un unimportant thing. For me, it's probably, I like early Taylor Swift better than later Taylor Swift. So I like later Taylor Swift too. So I can't even remember high school. I'm so old, but I, all her high school breakup songs, I can sing by heart. So um, I, that's an unimportant thing. And then when you get really into it, then there are some certain conversational skills that are just great. One is treat attention as an on-off switch, not a dimmer. So if I'm going to be paying attention to you, it's going to be 100% or 0%. I'm not going to multitask. Another one is be a loud listener. I have a buddy who, he, uh, when you're talking to him, he's like a Pentecostal church. He's like going, amen, yes, preach, preach. I love talking to that guy. Another one is don't be a topper. So if you tell me you're having trouble with your teenage son, and I say, oh, I know exactly what you're going through. I'm having trouble with my Tommy. It sounds like I'm trying to relate. But what I'm really doing is taking the conversation that was about you and making it a conversation about me. And I do that all the time. I'm a topper. And so I try to resist those things. And the final one I'll mention is make them authors, not witnesses. When people are telling you a story, they don't go into enough detail. And so if you sit, stop them and say, well, where was your boss sitting when she said that to you? Suddenly they're narrating a scene and you get a much fuller depiction of who they are once they're telling a story. And so even in journalism now, I don't ask people, what do you think? I ask people, how did you come to believe that? And that's a question that invites a story about some experience they had or some person who shaped their values. And suddenly you're getting to know the person. These are wonderful um, bits of advice, David. I think one thing that I was surprised and sort of embarrassed to learn was the power of, uh, I think it's sometimes called reflective listening or active listening. So yeah. I remember reading about this and trying it with my then partner, now wife, one evening sort of intentionally not offering an opinion or advice or doing the classic instinct I had and just literally trying to repeat back what I thought I heard she said, paraphrasing and so on, and thinking, gosh, this feels really awkward. And then she said, oh, wow, it's been really great talking tonight. And it's like, yeah. oh my goodness, we just had a deeper connection than if I had been trying to give advice and solve problems and just allowing her to feel like that she'd been hurt. You know? and, yeah. And that, the, and that again is a skill we don't develop and nurture enough. Yeah. So some psychologists call that looping. If mm. you tell me something and I try to paraphrase it back to you, so you I, so you were really mad at your mom. And then you, you might say, oh, no, I wasn't mad at my mom, but I felt diminished by my mom. There's a difference. And so the, the point is that we often misunderstand. We're not as clear yeah. as we think we are when we're talking, and we're not as good at understanding as we think we are. So if you go back and say, so what I, you know, what I hear you saying is, or you were saying this, then they can correct. And you'll be amazed how often you're wrong, <laughs> how often you sort of got it kind of wrong. And so you do the looping, and it really works. Now, I want to come on to a, a difficult topic of disagreeing with people. But before we do that, I can't leave your lovely Taylor Swift example, because the question there, what's your favorite unimportant thing about yourself is so lovely. So I'd like to just come back to our audience for a second and say to you folks, again, wherever you are in the world, what's your favorite unimportant thing about yourself? If you'd like to share in just a couple of words, let's get good at this sort of sharing a little bit of minor intimacy, you know, that it's a good conversation starter. And maybe I, I can read a few of these out again. So what's something about you that's kind of unimportant, but sort of fun and personal? So I'll read some of these out. I'm a twin. I love gazing at trees, doing the cryptic crossword, professional video gamer that no one knows, champion parallel parker. I love the color blue, watching auctions, going to the bowling alley. I, I love Star Trek movies. I collect jugs. I move my ears. I like chess. I'm a cloud watcher. I love purple. I walk barefoot. I drove a Morris Minor. I love animals. I like stickers. I'm a steampunk. I I, I, <laughs> I made poppies. I love funky socks. 
these are fabulous thank you folks david what a gorgeous question these are amazing yeah these are really each of these is amazing <laughs> it's uh, so th these are lovely ways to, to form a connection to learn about each other but of course we don't always see eye to eye with people and i, I think right now in our world so many people are, are sort of seeing past each other are, are sort of looking for the or almost fearing the other or looking for the bad in each other and sometimes it will, well it feels that we have to be able to disagree in a way where we can hear our disagreements and not be sort of talking past each other. I, I think of it as disagreeing agreeably almost. Um, mm. what, what are your tips on how we can do that in a constructive way? Yeah, I have a couple of chapters in the book about this. And, and one of the things is when somebody comes at me with a, a disagreement, ideological disagreement, or they're coming at me with a critique and they think my side is wrong, my instinct is want to restate my side and then say, oh, no, you don't understand. I'm one of the good guys here. I I'm trying to do this. You don't understand my situation. Uh, but I've come to learn that my job in that, when somebody comes at me with a dis disagreement and sometimes a critique, is to stand in their standpoint. It's to ask them three or four times in different language, go deeper in that. Tell me more about that. What am I missing here? Uh, and I may not persuade the person. They may not persuade me. But if I'm really trying to understand their viewpoint by asking again and again and again, I'm showing them respect. Uh, and there's a book called Crucial Conversations, and the authors in it say, in any conversation, respect is like air. Uh, when it's present, nobody notices. When it's absent, it's all anybody can think about. And so we want to show them respect. And basically, we want to be aware of the fact that every conversation takes place on two levels. There's the subject we're nominally talking about, but then there's the under conversation, the flow of emotions as we're talking. And with every comment, I'm either making you feel more safe or less safe, more respected or less respected. And it's that under conversation that's actually more important. And so we want to be aware of the volleys of emotions. And then two final things when you have a disagreement. One is um, keep the gem statement in the center. And the gem statement is the thing in the disagreement that we actually do agree upon. So if my brother and I are fighting about our dad's health care, we're arguing about that, but we both want what's best for our dad. And so that's the gem statement. And if we can keep what we disagree about in the center, then we preserve a relationship amid disagreement. And then the final thing I'll, I'll say is um, find the disagreement under the disagreement. So if you and I disagree on government policy, on taxes or something, What's the philosophical reason we actually disagree? So instead of just restating our positions, let's dig down and explore why we disagree about this. And, and that's the bad conversations are people making statements at each other. Good conversations go somewhere that we're both on a joint exploration to understand each other better and to understand ourselves better. That's just more fun. It feels to me that it's quite easy for us to assume bad intent in someone that we disagree with. It's much easier to say that's an evil person, that's a bad person, because they're not saying the thing I agree with. And the harder thing, the braver thing to say is, I disagree with them very strongly, and I can understand why, but I can also see that they might have good intention, even if I think it's misinformed, behind their behavior and behind their intent. And in fact, doing what you've just suggested, which is listening, trying to understand their perspective, mm -hmm. very often reveals that a very, very small proportion of people are actually psychopathic. Almost everyone wants a good outcome in some way, but they may have very, very different backgrounds, very different perspectives and so on. Do, yeah. do you think that's the right way of looking at it? That actually yeah. it's about seeing good intent, but with different perspectives? Yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, that I'm a strong critic of Trump. And so I've spent a lot of time talking to Trump voters. And sometimes they'll email me um, vicious emails. And I'll turn around and write a quick reply showing that I and not dismissive of their view. And 90% of the time, uh, immediately they turn around and there's respect there. And th they're, the viciousness of their tone drops away and they just want to get there. They realize I'm a human on the other side and we just have a conversation. And I try to get people in narrative mode. So I was with a Trump voter in the state of South Dakota several years ago now. And I, you know, we were talking about Trump and what he, why I liked him. And he said, let me tell you about the death, best day of my life. And he says to me, I'm 70 now. The best day in my life was when I was 35. And I was working at a plant that makes refrigeration units. And they changed the technology, and I could no longer be the foreman of my section of the plant. So they laid me off. 
And I decided I was going to just try to get out of there quietly. So I put my stuff in a box in my office and I opened the office door and there were 3,600 people forming a double line from his office door in the plant through the plant and out the, to the parking lot and out to his car door. And he walked through that line as everybody in the plant applauded him until he got to the car. And he said, that was the best day of my life. And then he says, every job I've had since then has been worse, more pay or less pay, less enjoyment. And so my life has been downhill for 35 years. And so I, you, you may think Donald Trump is a jackass, but I, I need a change. And so that didn't persuade me to like Donald Trump, but I understood his point of view. And I got that story out of him. And I will tell you, in my career as a journalist, if I ask somebody to tell me their life story, how often have they said none of your damn business? The answer is zero. If you respectfully ask them their life story, they will talk and they love to talk. Mm. Uh, and it's often because no one has ever asked them their life story. Mm, that's really powerful, really lovely story. Um, and I'm reminded that actually, I believe some co people working in conflict resolution in you know, really extreme situations, use a technique where they ask the two opposing sides to try and restate the other side's yeah. perspective in their own words until they've got it clear. And actually that feels to me that if we could just be more open to trying to see the human yeah. story behind the other person's perspective, we'd just be able to get along so much better. Yeah, we've, we've got an organization in the States called Braver Angels, which brings people, reds and blues together, uh, Republicans and Democrats. And weirdly, they found that debating is a way to come together. You think if staging a debate would everybody be fighting but in fact and they do it sort of oxford style so you don't address the other side you address the chair uh and but and somehow by having that debate addressing the chair they're respectful to the chair and they're getting their point of view across in a serious and substantive way but without personal attack and after that goes back and forth each side understands the other way better and they understand their own position way better and they they agree, you know, 80% of the time they realize, oh, uh, we agree on a way more than I thought we did. And I, that's another technique. Weirdly, that Oxford style debate seems to work. Um, David, before we come to questions, and I know there's going to be lots of great questions from our community, as always, you, you write about something else really powerful in the book, which is particularly resonant for us in the Action of Happiness community, where we're dealing with a lot of people who are struggling with different aspects around mental health challenges anxiety, isolation, depression, and so on. And you talked about sitting with someone who was dealing with depression, I think, in that case. And, and that, that's a sort of particular style of being able to see and hear and support another person. Do you want to say a bit about that? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. So this was something that happened to me a, a couple of years ago. I, my oldest friend in the world was a guy named Pete. We met when we were 11 and we were lifelong friends. And when he was 57, Pete got hit by a severe depression. And I think of myself as a reasonably uh, well-read person, but I didn't really understand what depression was. Those of us who are fortunate enough never to have it, we can't understand it by extrapolating from our moments of sadness. Uh, another friend of mine who suffered from it said, depression is a malfunction in the instrument we use to determine reality. So uh, it's my friend had lying voices in his head saying, nobody will miss you, you're worthless. And so his his... his his voices were lying to him. And early on, I made some of the mistakes that people make who are unskilled as I was in the art of sitting with someone who's depressed. First thing I did is I tried to tell him, give him ideas on how to get out of depression. And so that I would say, you know, you used to do service trips to Vietnam. Why don't you do that? You'll find it so rewarding. And I later learned that giving people ideas to get out of depression is just another way of saying you don't get it because it's not ideas they're missing. It's the energy and so much else. Then the second mistake I made, which I think is also common, is what the psychologists call positive reframing. I said, you, you have such a great life. You love your career. You have a great family. Your kids are wonderful. And I learned later that when you do that, you're just reminding the depressed person they're not enjoying the things that are palpably enjoyable. And so I gradually learned out what to do. Not that it's going to make a difference. In some ways, words, which is my, how I make my living, sometimes they're just weak and they're not going to do anything because words are their limits to what words can achieve. But you can first acknowledge the reality of the situation. This sucks. This sucks. And at least if you understand what they're going through, they feel less alone. Second, 
I learned you can just express goodwill. I want more for you. I want more for you. Third, you can give people little touches. Uh, just send them texts, postcard if you're traveling somewhere. No response necessary. I'm just here for you. And that's to show that you're never going away. That they may feel alone, they may feel they're going through a dark time, but your presence is permanent. And as I say, it may not cure the depression, but at least it's a graceful way of showing up. And Viktor Frankl, who wrote this great book, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, when he was confronting with somebody contemplating suicide, he would say, life has not stopped except expecting things of you. Life has not stopped expecting things of you. You have duties here. And it sounds kind of harsh, but it calls people forth to say, yes, I, there's something I could still give. And somebody who's enduring depression has credibility with those who are also enduring depression. There's a great Thornton Wilder, without your pain, where would your power be? Uh, the fact that you've been sort of broken on the wheels of life gives you credibility. Your low voice trembles in the hearts of men. He writes, in love service, only the wounded soldiers can serve. And so people who've been through hard times have a wisdom about them that they can use to help others. And so I think these are all things we can talk about, and it make no, may make no difference. And my friend Pete ultimately succumbed to it. But at least it's a more graceful way of being present with somebody who's going through such a horrible disease. Thank you, David. That, that's so wise. I, I'm such a fan of that Viktor Frankl book, and I must admit I hadn't really seen that particular insight before. Um, but I certainly agree with you that when someone who's been dealing with uh, sort of inner demons and is able to talk about that publicly, rather than it being a source of stigma and shame, I, it can very often be a huge inspiration to others around them and actually creates much stronger connections and really uplifts the positive impact they can have but I love how you've reminded us also that friendship is partly just about showing up just saying I'm here for you mm. nothing else required really but I'm thinking of you I care about you so powerful um let's um let's well let's bridge to questions with my final question to you really which is in this community we care so much about not only our own happiness and well-being, but also spreading these ideas to others. I think in many ways, you know, what you've written in this book and what we're talking about here today is reminding us of the importance of this. And obviously, one thing we can do is model this in the way that we are in the yeah. world. But how else can we or should we as a society make more of this kind of stuff happen? Yeah, I think. well, I think modeling is tremendously powerful. A friend of mine says what a wise person says is the least of that which they give. What gets remembered is their behavior in the smallest particular. Never forget the message is the person. And so I used to work, say, for a guy named Jim Lehrer on TV, who's an American TV host. And when I would talk during my first, the 10 years we were on the air together, if I said something crass, his mouth would turn down in displeasure. And if I said something he thought was intelligent, his eyes would crinkle with pleasure. And he never said anything to me, but for 10 years, I just chased the eye crinkle and tried to avoid the mouth turn. And so that little gesture was just a guide to me of how to, how to how, this is how we do things here. And so that's one thing. Second, frankly, I think our schools should be teaching these basic social skills, how to end a conversation gracefully, how to ask for an offer of forgiveness, how to break up with somebody without destroying their heart, how to know how to pace your revelation of vulnerability in the course of a relationship. These are just skills. And I... It, I hope they're taught at home, but sometimes they're not taught at home. And I literally think our schools should have, co have courses in basic social skills. And of course, they do. Many schools do have social and emotional learning. And I think it's just tremendously important. But nobody should graduate high school without having instruction on how to ask somebody out on a date, <laughs> like, even something like that. I read a study recently about how some of the lonely young men. And one of the causes, according to the study, they just stink at flirting. <laughs> and so... <laughs> I don't know if we should have whole courses on how to flirt, but it would make people less lonely. <laughs> yeah, thank you, David. Very well said. So let's come to some of the questions in our Q&A. And please remember that you can vote on each other's questions. So if you see another question that you'd like to have answered, please do give it a thumbs up. Um, Claire has asked, how do we enter into a deep conversation with people who are convinced by conspiracy theories? I find yeah. it so hard to understand when so many of these theories are based on kind of things beyond comprehension. Yeah, I, I, it's a hard thing. I made that distinction between the illuminator and the diminisher. 
And so one of the questions, if we're trying to be an illuminator, what do you do with someone who's an administrator, who's just not curious, who just doesn't care, who or has conspiracy theories where it's like a self-enclosed system that explains everything that you can't get inside of? And so I think the things I've learned is first to lead with a little curiosity uh, and to say, well, so, you know, wh where'd you come to believe this? What, what in your childhood do you think causes this, you to believe this or explains your values? And if they don't pick up, then they don't pick up if they don't have any curiosity about you. The second is a slight hint of vulnerability. So, you know, I'm just not sure. You know, I, I struggle thinking about this. I, I'm just not sure about this. And to see if they have any invulnerability in their mental makeup, or do they think they have the truth 100%. Uh, and so these are little ways. And then I, I, again, trying to tell them, get them to tell stories about their childhood. Uh, people love to talk about their childhood. And so these are ways you can try to open the door. But they may not be successful. And I've found if somebody just has their walls up, and they're just bloviating at you, then there's really no way in. And you just have to accept the fact that this it, relationship has got to be reciprocal. And if they're not willing to reciprocate, the relationship will only go so deep. And for example, I had a, uh, I was having a phone conversation this years ago during the Obama administration in the US. And I was talking to a friend in the White House and we were talking and in the, about into the call, my phone dropped, the cell coverage dropped. And so I thought, oh, he'll realize I'm not there and he'll call me back in two minutes. So I wait a minute or two and he doesn't call me back and I wait five minutes, I wait seven minutes. Finally, I call his office and I talk to his assistant and she says, oh, he can't, he can't come to the phone. He's on the phone with somebody. And I tell her, he's on the phone with me. He doesn't realize he's been bloviating for 10 minutes. Uh, and so somebody's just like that. They're, they're not curious. It's all outgoing for them. It's limits to what you can do, I'm afraid. But it feels to me that sometimes in these, especially in like a, a conspiracy theory type example where we 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 see we think somebody's got the wrong idea of the world that we think our role is to try and convince them with other facts and yet it feels to yeah. me from what you're saying that at the intellectual fact level isn't really where connection yeah. happens it happens at the, the the respect heartfelt trust level and in fact we're much more likely to shape and respond to people wisely if there's a sense of connection and trust not because we're going to prove that their facts are wrong is that, right. is that right? You think? I, th I think that's right. I mean, you can't reason people out of positions they didn't reason themselves into. Uh, and the the reason, I, in my view, people go for emo for conspiracy theories is they feel people are out to get them. Mm. And conspiracy theories gives them a very neat story to explain why these bad people are out to get them. And if you can lessen that under under emotion, the, the uh, undercurrent of emotion in the conversation, uh, then you can begin to get to that conspiracy theory, at least to loosen, or at least that's the best you can do. Now, Estelle has asked a very popular question here. How do we get over the feeling that you have nothing interesting to say and other people talking in a group situation are a lot more interesting? Yeah, that's that's wrong. <laughs> in my view, everybody is fascinating on some subject uh, and everything everybody you meet is better than you on some subject. And it could be you're surrounded by, uh, if I'm surrounded by mathematicians, I'm probably gonna, not going to add a lot to the conversation, but I can ask them questions about their love of math, and I can get them talking not as just simple mathematicians, but as people who fell in love with a certain field. And they, then they start talking about their love of math, and I can say, well, as I mentioned earlier, I read a book called Paddington the Bear, and I had developed a similar love of, of writing. And then suddenly we're on subjects that we're both fascinated and fascinating on. And so there are plenty of those subjects. And one of the, re one of the main reasons people don't really see each other is, well, the main reason is egotism. Uh, we're just so proud of ourselves that we're, we're not interested in other people. Some, sometimes we just can't get in somebody else's perspective. And so there's a story I tell in the book about a guy who's on one side of the river and there's a woman on the other side of the river and she shouts at him, how do I get to the other side of the river? And he shouts back at her, you are on the other side of the river. Like he can't get outside of his own perspective to see her perspective. But sometimes it's our own self-doubts. It's our own fear that we don't have something interesting to say. But if we reduce it to the level, to the basic human level of what drives you, what do you dream about? Or if this five years is a chapter in your life, what's the chapter about? If we get the conversation onto the personal level, 
then there's going to be something parallel that will be very fascinating about. I find almost everybody, in fact, I would say everybody is fascinating when telling the story of their life because everybody is more interesting than the stereotypes we have about them. And so if you are doubting that you have something interesting to say, bring it down to a human level. Why'd you go into that? Why did you start it? Why you? Why was it you who felt you had to start that company? And suddenly you're at the human level and everybody's fascinating at that level. One thing I find challenging, David, is, is knowing the balance between asking questions versus volunteering things about myself. I yeah. had a friendship with um, um, someone, from, uh, an, an Indian man who I was working with, and we had a lovely friendship, but my tendency was to ask questions and his tendency was to talk about himself. And that led to a rather one-sided conversation. And I realized that what he really wanted me to do was to share more about myself. And then he could ask me questions about me. And so I'd missed that subtlety of opening up and being willing to offer rather than ask. How do we get that balance right? Yeah, I think that is, well, first we have to be aware of cultural differences. Yeah. Uh, and so sometimes there's people come from cultures where that kind of sharing is, 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 not, is a little discouraged. And I would recommend if anybody wants to read a great book, um, aside from mine, of course, uh, they can read um, a book by a guy named Tracy Kidder called The Strength of What Remains. And Kidder's a white guy from Boston or Massachusetts. And it's a story about a guy named Deo who was uh, survived the genocide in Rwanda, or actually in Burundi. Uh, and in Burundi, apparently, they have a culture that you don't talk about the past, you don't talk about bad events in the past. And they have two words for this, both of which are negative. And so he had to be tread very carefully by before asking Deo how he survived the Rwandan genocide. But by sharing a little of his own story, you're inviting somebody else. And there's a, a great book by Frederick Buechner, uh, who's a novelist. And he said, you know, some, it's called Telling Secrets. And he says, sometimes we need to tell secrets to others. And if we tell secrets, then we won't fall for the myth we tell about ourselves. Well, all the stuff we lean on our clean uh, tail, if we tell a secret, suddenly we'll realize, oh, yeah, that, that story I present to the world, that's not quite accurate. And then he says, and if we tell secrets, then we make it easier for other people to tell secrets of their own. And I, I do think that's the general pattern. And as you said before, sometimes we'll be betrayed. They won't pick up. We'll tell a secret and they won't pick it up. Nothing you can do about that. But it's still worth it to lean in with respect and curiosity and honesty. And so if you ask me a question, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to invite honesty by saying, well, here's my situation. And it feels like you're also hinting at playfulness as well. Some of that is about sort of taking the mask off and being a little bit more human. I loved how you opened this event by sort of acknowledging that you're about to sneeze. And that's a lovely <laughs> kind of connection at a human level. Um, let's come on to Mayan's question. Um, when I'm in a conversation that's turning into an argument, how can I avoid that type of conversation without hurting the other person? Yeah. So some, sometimes we get in conversations and our motivations deteriorate. And so we say we're at a company and we're arguing about a marketing plan. At the first, we're just arguing about a marketing plan. We both want what's best for the company. So we have different views on how we should market some product. But as we get into the conversation, the argument and the fight, our motivations deteriorate. And it's no longer what marketing plan is best. It's me trying to prove I'm smarter than you. Me trying to prove I'm more powerful than you. And suddenly our motivations have deteriorated. Uh, and that's when we're going to be upset. And my first words are, if you f sense your motivations are deteriorating, stop the conversation. Because everything you say after it will, will weaken the relationship. And I met a guy even just a couple months ago who said, my wife and I didn't stop once our motivations deteriorated. We kept talking. And we said so many ugly and nasty things to each other that we couldn't repair our relationship and we had to get divorced. But so first stop. And then you can do, when, when it turns into a real fight, it's because each person thinks the other person's motivations are bad. And so what you can do is a thing called splitting, which is where you say, here's what I intended, and here's what I didn't intend. So you say, I didn't mean to silence you. I just thought your voice was best applicable here. And so here's what I didn't mean to do. Here's what I did mean to do. And when you do that thing called splitting, you're clarifying your motivations. And you're like stopping the downward momentum of the argument. And you're saying, wait, let's start over. And then you can say, you know, we've just had a hot moment between us. But at least we've unveiled who we really are and what we feel. And so let's invest, let's explore those feelings a little more. 
And great friendships, like great relationships, are not built on the high of the great times. They're built on repair after bad times. And so that's one way I think you can repair a conversation and hopefully make the relationship stronger. I'm reminded um, of something really powerful I once learned in the context of relationships, which was when I say something to you, David, there were sort of three components to it. One is my intention uh, in what I'm saying. Another is um, how I then say it. And then the other is um, how you receive it. And I can only control two of those things, my intention and how I say it. I have no control over how that's received by you. And you obviously can interpret how you receive it and you can observe how I said it, but you don't really know my intention behind it. And of course, the same is true in reverse. And so the humility that comes with that, which is like that we, you know, we need to notice that we don't know what someone's intent is. uh, And also that we don't know how what we say will be interpreted. That creates a sense of let's remember the things that we can describe accurately, like our intention and the things that we can't really describe actually like what you did when you described someone else. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think subtlety is really important. Yeah, I think it's being aware of um, how little we know, how much mm-hmm. might be going on in somebody else's life. And so there's a story Stephen Covey, who's a great writer, tells, which is in the subway in New York. You call it the tube or in Britain or whatever. Uh, and uh, there's a guy being completely, un- his kids are completely unruly and he's doing nothing. And the kids are are um, are just, um, be, you know, make, making everybody's trip miserable because they're screaming and they're shouting and they're running around. And finally, Covey says to him, you know, you really ought to get control of your kids. And the guy says, oh, I'm sorry. We're just coming home from the hospital where their mom passed away and I'm just kind of lost. And so suddenly that one answer turned around Covey's whole perception of the situation. Because mm-hmm. he didn't, he knew like 5% of what that guy was going through. But he didn't know 95. And so it's that awareness that we don't know what's going on in other people's lives. And we should, we should understand we only, we're, I'm only seeing 5% of you at this moment. And there's another 95%. And I've got to be aware that that's, that's going to be deep in there. And maybe I'll get to know that other 95%. And hopefully, over the course of a friendship, we'll, we'll see 50% of each other. But always being aware that there's that other percent that we don't know. Yeah, and that reminds me that we should try not to take things too personally because very often the way others behave towards us says a lot more about what's going on for them than it does about us, and yet we tend to take it rather personally. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. It's a really powerful story. Uh, Louise has asked a great question. You, you mentioned earlier how you often get criticism sent to you, and I know a lot of public figures like you have some awful things sent. She's just asked, can David give an example of what he says to the people who send him criticism? Uh, yeah, I, you don't have to say much. Uh, so if somebody says your views on the Middle East are are stupid, all you have to say is, um, well, here's why I thought that, but you know, I could be wrong. What do you think? And that's it. And all it takes is a little hint of, of I'm a human here too, and I've got some uncertainty. And, and their tone utterly changes. And I find that happens 95% of the time. And there's an occasional person who just stays furious uh, and is brutal. And that's on them. And for them, you just have to have a thick skin. But I find 95% of the time, people's tone change as soon as you show a hint of respect and curiosity. That's really wise. Kathy's asking a question which goes a little bit more into controversy, but building on that same theme. What what if you find that the person's reason for disagreeing with you is because of uh, some underlying racism or sexism, in her example? You know, something that really touches on ethical principles that you hold dearly. Yeah. Well, some people you just have to freeze out. I mean, there are some people who, you know, you're not going to have a great conversation with a Nazi or, you know, that may be an extreme example, but with a racist. But uh, there are some people whose views seem extremely bigoted, but who there's room to grow there. Uh, And, you know, there's a story I read. I don't think I put this in the book. It's of a guy who was a young skinhead and a young neo-Nazi. And he's in therapy. They, the, tri- the court system makes him go to therapy. Uh, and so he's venting with his therapist about how evil Jews are. And finally, the therapist says, well, you should know I'm Jewish. And the guy was mortified. And it was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to say, dump that all on you. And the therapist said, well, you dumped that all on me. But if I looked up deep down, I don't think that's who you really are. And the guy starts crying. 
Uh, and so, uh, you know, people are complicated and some of the most vicious people are just hurting. Uh, and some of the most vicious people are vicious in one part, but they're okay in another part. And so the only way to rebut that or to heal the viciousness is to try to let them see that their views are, are bigoted. And what is bigotry? Bigotry, like racism, is the inability to see another person's face. And this book was in part motivated by a great opening of Ralph Ellison's novel, Invisible Man. And he is a black narrator saying, uh, when people look at me, they see everything but me. They see their stereotypes. They see generalizations. They see the environment around me. They don't see me. And he's making the point that the cruelest thing you can do is to be indifferent to someone, is to not see the individual who's there. And so the book is really an effort to show what the Black experience was like when he wrote it in probably 50 or 60 years ago. And through that experience, we can understand, if people are not Black, we can understand the experience uh, and um, see the human being. I think that point about seeing the human being is the fundamental message here, David. Um, tomorrow, we're going to send around a link to a video of this conversation, to all the wonderful comments in the chat, a link to the book, and also to a lovely um, article you wrote in The Atlantic recently, which really touched me about some of the challenges we face and how we can respond more widely to it. So uh, on behalf of everyone here today, thank you so much for the work you're doing and for sharing so much of that with us in such a wise and heartfelt way today. Thank you to everyone who's been involved for your amazing comments in the chat and also the really wise questions and for answering that question about something about you that's uh, personal. I, I really love that, some beautiful answers. But David, I wanted to leave you with the final word really. Is there any, how would you wrap up this conversation and leave us with something to take yeah. away today? Well, I saw somebody in chat didn't quite get the title of the book, so I'm going to repeat it as an author. It's called How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen. And the final thing I can say, if, if I can get okay at seeing others, then anybody can, because uh, I really grew up with, or I possess no native ability in this department. But it, you, you study the techniques, and it's like theater school, like actors go to the theater school to learn certain techniques of acting. But that doesn't mean when they're on stage, they're consciously thinking of their techniques. They're not. They've internalized them, so they become a way of life. And we want to shoot for that, a, a way of life that is um, more generous to others, where we see each other with just and loving attention where we see each other with just and loving attention. I, I, I think that's the perfect way to end. Thank you for um, sharing this with us and encouraging us to, to put this into practice. I think this is something we want for the world, but it's something that starts with each of us and we can bring this spirit to the way that we are with each other and the way we, we model this in our communities and friendships. So David, thank you. Keep up the great work and thank you everyone for being part of this. See you next time. Thank you.